The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Today's message is part two of trembling at God's word. Isaiah 66 verses 12 and 13, for all those things my hands have made, that's what the Lord's speaking, and all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this is the one that I'm going to look, on him who is of a poor and a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. It's Who's the one that really honors me? And we shared last week that I was reading Malachi and it really hit me. I was thinking, gee, uh, they weren't being blessed because they didn't tithe. And then I looked at it again, I'm going, oh no, in Malachi, they tithe. They gave the blind, the lame, and the rotten food. <laughs> oh, they gave, but there was an attitude of the heart that was missing. And God basically told me, even when I was a young Christian, He taught me to tithe. It wasn't comfortable at first. It was like, oh my goodness, that's a lot. <laughs> but after I tithe, God said, that's nothing. What I want you to do is maintain a generous attitude. Because its attitude will determine your performance. And you can do something grudgingly and you can do something cheerfully. Right? But God said, this is the one that I'm looking at. I'm looking at a heart. I'm not looking just at the outward action. I'm looking at the motivation behind that outward action. And so, uh, what I wanted to cover today is something that we're writing, our, bo our book will be out in 2019, I noticed it's already on Amazon, but we're not done yet, uh, <laughs> uh, on breaking soul ties. And what I wanted to really cover was, uh, we finished up part one of Trembling at God's Word with four characteristics of a meek person. And by meek, I meant one who accept God's dealings as good and without despite, you know, disputing or resisting. That's actually linked to a word called humility. <laughs> Meekness and humility. Uh, without disputing or resisting, means that there's negative circumstances that come into your life, and there's temptations that come into your life, and they're tailor-made for you. If you see the same old temptation, guess what? It's a blessing in disguise telling you this is what you need work on, or it wouldn't be repeating itself over and over again, right? You could actually say, hmm, we used to say that about emotions. Emotions are your friends. They're telling you that Jesus isn't ruling right now, right? Anger, hurt, Fear, lust, guilt, shame. Jesus isn't ruling. There's something drawing you away. And if you will yield and surrender to Him, He's the only one that can take that pain, take that grief, take that anger, etc., etc. So, I'm looking at this qualification, and I'm looking at these four, four elements or characteristics of those people. This is what we concluded with last, in the last message, is four characteristics of those that are meek. And these are the ones that God's going to look upon. So we need to say we need to be inspiring ourselves to move forward in that direction. But the first thing is approachable spirit to spirit. To be approachable spirit to spirit means you don't have walls. People that have walls up, when they meet you, you don't touch them spirit to spirit. You touch the persona of what they want to convey. And it could be a false face. It could be an image that they want to project, not the real them. Hmm? That's why I'm saying girls, when you're, if you're single and you're dating somebody, you get to know how they behave in real life, not on that first date when they're putting their best foot forward. You need to say, do you have a job? <laughs> do you, you need to ask questions. Do you still live with mom and dad? Are you in debt? Uh-huh. 
Is that your hair? <laughs> Guys, I want to see you without makeup. See, I want to see what she looks like without the makeup. You need to ask a lot of questions, don't you? Huh? But I looked and I says, to know somebody by the Spirit is so much better than the facade. And actually, you have a capacity, because you have an anointing that abides within, where the Holy Spirit will teach you to know by the Spirit, not according to the flesh. But you have to die to that, you have to die to that right to judge. You know, many, many mistakes are made by judging first appearances. Judgment is an observation. Discernment is the motive. And true spiritual discernment that every one of you has, if you develop it. Most people don't develop it because they trust in what they observe. And by the way, they enter into what is false discernment or suspicion. And you can sow suspicion into people's lives based on your opinion. An opinion can be full of suspicion and bad seed. But discernment knows the motive. Now, I used to know a lady in my church that I felt like, in my first pastorate, I felt like if I said something stupid from the pulpit, she would know me more by the Spirit and say, oh, I know what he meant. That's somebody that knows you. The one that goes, well, I, I never, I can't believe they said that. They probably don't know you by the Spirit. They probably just know it by content and coming through their own prism, right? I even had a friend once, he said, I say a lot of stupid things, so when I do something stupid, they think I'm just acting stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's a facade. But listen, the characteristic internally is to be able to contact the person spirit to spirit. And when I was a young Christian, I didn't even want to know that because I felt the duplicity that was coming from people. And I had a hard time believing it was a gift. It was like, I've got enough issues of my own. I don't want to know when someone's not real. Hi. Hi, Pastor. I love you. And then it feels like, <laughs> It's like, I don't want to know that. And God says, it's not about you. It's about you learning how to properly respond to that. That person's trying or they wouldn't have bothered even saying that. Now they might be trying in the flesh to manipulate, they might be trying in the flesh to not hate you, they could, it could be all kinds of things. But you have a responsibility before Almighty God as a believer to respond properly. And I learned from that time on, it's how you respond. It's not what someone else is doing. It's not what someone else is saying. It's how do I respond to someone else doing or saying something good or bad. And quite frankly, all of our books were written out of my not running from God and allowing God to cultivate that discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits covers three realms. It covers your human spirit. It covers the Holy Spirit and it covers evil spirits, all three. And it basically detects the source or the nature, that's the character, nature, or the source of a person or a thing. And I saw that in discerning that, it's not to be nosy and say, oh, now I know. It's basically to find a loving, redemptive solution to what you discern. And that's where I was kind of uh, bothered in the church because I was raised in Pentecostal charismatic type churches, but I saw what people were calling the sermon. Sister so-and-so's got a Jezebel spirit. And Sister so-and-so's got a that spirit. I didn't see any redemption. Where's the redemption? Well, I'm just speaking the truth. Okay, the truth should have a redemptive, loving. Where is it? I don't see it. So I believe that what God has taken us to is to a people who are going to have a, a humble and a contrite spirit who are going to be able to meet people spirit to spirit without sucking in bad 
but without pushing away a needy person. Um, I've given this example a million times, but when the Lord showed it to me was once I was doing altar ministry, and a woman came up, and she had walls of rejection like you wouldn't believe. I was shocked she even came up. People with rejection sometimes don't even bother. They just, she came up, and I felt a wall. And it's like you can't penetrate somebody else's will. If they put up a wall, that's there. And the tendency is the person next to them was, like that, yielded, surrendered. The anointing can work there readily. And I was about ready to go, well, bless you, and move to the next person. And God said, don't do that. And I went, whoop. And I got back, and I'm going, but there's a wall here. This person is all closed off. And I just release love. Like, out of my belly flows love. So I just said, well, look for a loving redemption. I cannot change their will, but I can certainly love. And I release love, and all of a sudden, this is the way it felt in the spirit. Like, it was a trembling, and she dropped it. And this is the most beautiful part. She burst out crying and said, God really does love me. She felt the love of God. She didn't say, Dennis, the pastor really loves me. She said, God really loves me. So it was an anointing, but by removing her wall, she must have, even if you just open a little bit, you open a little bit to God, he'll come in, all right? Can you see that? So my discernment may have been accurate, but if I would have moved to the next person that was more open, my discernment over here was accurate but non-redemptive. Does that make sense? Accurate? So it's not about being right then, is it? Discernment's not about being right. Discernment's about you have now a responsibility to act redemptively accordingly. How are you going to do it? You're going to have to inquire of God because sometimes it's say something, sometimes it's shut up. Sometimes it's confront. Sometimes it's don't you dare. There's no rules. It's called obedience to God. And this is what we saw in part one of those that tremble at my word have prompt obedience. They, they, they're comfortable with prompt obedience. Uh, they, they, in that quickness, they move into life more quickly and more readily. Okay? Uh, they obey even when it hurts. They obey when it doesn't make sense. They obey when there doesn't seem to be a benefit to it. What was the benefit to me going here? And you know, if I had even the least bit of pride, and a lot of preachers do, if I had the least bit of pride, I could look better, huh? Going to someone who's accepting ministry. <laughs> and don't think that doesn't enter into people's heads. All right? But that's flesh. It isn't about how you look, it isn't about being seen or heard, it isn't about an agenda, looking for a position. You know, I said, you could train up a mature church if you would just teach them two things. And this is so hard. <sighs> Deal with your issues and die to your agendas. And we're going to get into that. Because I believe to really, to really move forward in the uh, elements of meekness, those that tremble at his word. So, first of all... You have the ability to contact spirit to spirit. Secondly, you become highly sensitive to atmosphere. Do you know little children who don't have the cognitive ability developed in their head yet? If dad comes home frustrated or angry, without a word he emanates into the, into the spirit, that child's spirit picks up. He creates an atmosphere. So don't you, I know people are like, words, 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 and I didn't say nothing bad. No, but the attitude and the cloud you brought into the room is discernible. I've learned children of alcoholics and, and, and uh, abused children, they learn to, first they pick it up in their spirit. What kind of mood is dad in? But he, they, they're picking that up even if he's not talking. And 
one of the most important, matter of fact, it was Kimball Knight, wasn't it? We were doing a conference with uh, oh, several big names in, in Massachusetts, and, uh, and Kimball Knight really got a kick out of what we were doing, so he, he was doing it in his meetings, too. I said, you can fool people with your words, and you can fool them with your body language or gestures, but you cannot hide what you emanate. And that you can do it, you can do it right here. You can worship, of course we worship with words, all right, because that adds specificity. But you can worship. As a matter of fact, this is the way God took me to the school of the Spirit, is because you're so word-oriented and talking-oriented that you miss out on the best part of His presence because most supernatural is too quiet for your thinking. You're too busy thinking and talking. Some of the most difficult people to minister to is the ones that come forward in a line and are going, ah, da, da, ba, da, da, ba, da, because they're giving at a time when they should be receiving. It's the same way with prayer. What God had to do is take me, a talker, and teach me to sit still and touch him spirit to spirit. And in that touching of that spirit, you don't talk until you have something to say. A lot of people like to talk just because they have nervous energy and their flesh really has never been weaned. Say that word back to me. Weaned. Your flesh needs to be weaned. What does weaned flesh mean? It means you have to learn to sit still, and many of you can't. You've got to learn to not talk, not think, but commune spirit to spirit. That's part of growing. If you can't sit still quietly, there's, there's something in you that's still flesh ruled. In other words, if you have to pace while you pray, there's still part of your flesh that needs to calm down. I like to pace and pray, but I don't have to. If you have to, then it's got you. You don't have it. Right? So spirit to spirit is the first step, but this is the one that I'm going to look upon. And God took me to the school of the Spirit through Isaiah 50, verses 4 and 5. He basically says, I'm going to awaken, I'm going to give you the tongue, that's talking, teaching, I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple. Well, I want that. I want to be a teacher of the, of the Word of God. That's what you call me to. I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple so that you could speak a word in season to them that are weary. In season to them that are weary also means has to do with timing, doesn't it? In season. There's times when you need to shut up and there's times when you need to speak. But he says, I'm going to awaken your ear to hear morning by morning. Now, wait a minute. You're going to give me the tongue of a disciple, but you're telling me I have to listen first. And I can remember how that worked, how impatient I was. God would give me a word like, there's a river. And I go, there, and then I would interrupt him and preach everything I knew about river. I was entertaining God, I guess. He said, there's a river, and it had life on it. And as soon as I felt that life, I thought I had to talk. I felt life, so it must mean I got to talk. So I said, there's a river that makes glad the city of God, and, and I'm going to, and, and the anointing decreases. Wait a minute, what's wrong with, what did I do wrong? I got still again, and the anointing increased. Oh, I guess God wasn't finished talking yet. And you know what? That's when he gave me the scripture, like David, like a weaned child with its mother, I have quieted my soul within me. Because you can fool them with your words, and you can fool them with your gestures, but you can't, you can't stop what you emanate. But when you emanate, those of you who can, are sensitive, and that's the second requirement of a broken and a contrite heart, is you are sensitive to other people by the Spirit more than by their gesture and more than by their words. So what's the first thing? To be meek is to be quite really approachable spirit to spirit. To know by the Spirit, not according to flesh. Secondly, you develop it so that it doesn't go unnoticed in your interpersonal relationship. I can sit in a group and if, if somebody's talking and everybody wants them to stop talking, did you know that they actually emanate something in the room? 
if you're a leader, that might be say, that's a good time to move on now. Hmm? I know during a sermon, I know if it's getting too long, I can feel the weariness on people. And you go, okay, it's time to bring this to a the close. They're getting sleepy. I can remember preaching messages throughout the 42 years in ministry to where I said something and could feel somebody go, <clears throat> they didn't like what I said or they misinterpreted what I said or they didn't agree with what I said. It's called prejudice. They would call it a bad witness. <laughs> hmm? And then I used it. How did I use that redemptively? You know what I would do? I would retrace what I just said to see if I did say something stupid, which happens often. <laughs> In public ministry, you're going to say the wrong thing. Right? Cliff and Stina will never let, let, live it down the time that I said, and it was like the woman that, that, that washed Jesus' hair. I don't, no, I, I don't think that's what I meant. <laughs> right? Not missing the move in another person's spirit doesn't go unnoticed. Now here's the third element, and this is the third element of a broken and a contrite heart. And this is something that I feel is really important. And that is, <clears throat> they touch the spirit of the body and belong. You can be in church your whole life and never in the spirit truly touch the body. Whether you're single or married, there is a touching of the body, a making a connection. Brothers and sisters, family. It has nothing to do with whether you're single or married. It has to do with making a connection to where even if you can't find words for it, you know this is the fam or something like, you know, this is my tribe. This is a DNA. This is where God's placed me. All right. There's that, there's that inner knowing and making a connection. And here's why our next book coming out in 2019 is going to be on soul ties. Here's what I've seen. If 1 John 1, I think it's verse 7, says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another so I like the way Norman Grubb used to use that illustration is that when you get saved the roof comes off of your house <laughs> and you touch God and when you say Jesus Christ is Lord of my life even to your enemies and unsaved people the walls are down that momentarily you are being vulnerable isn't that vulnerable to say to friend and foe alike that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, you, that you've never been more vulnerable. The walls are down. There's people that might use that against you. The walls are down. You are vulnerable at that point. And then you go to church and gradually, for whatever reason, start to put the walls up. So you say, I'm still open to God. But you cannot honestly say scripturally, by the Spirit, I am walking in the light as He is in the light, because then I would have fellowship one with another. Without, that's why our small groups has accountability. And it is the opposite of authoritarianism. It's not about, you have, get one of those bookmarks on your way out, but we have a bookmark on there that says, the only one responsible for talking about your Christian walk this week is you. <laughs> It's not what somebody else thinks. It's not their discernment. It's basically God discerning you. You'll never grow in discernment unless you let God start with you. He developed my discernment over the years, but he started by saying, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing asunder between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, and all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him. So it's not just ink on a page, is it? It's the person that lives within me. He will, dis if you let Him teach you, you have an anointing that abides within, He will discern you. So before you get 
real proficient at discerning someone else. As a matter of fact, we even teach people you don't discern anybody else. Even if you discern somebody else, use the blue card. <laughs> Why? Why? Because it's not about your gifting. You could actually hinder. You want them to say what's going on in them. Afterwards, you can confirm it. Like there's a lot of times I get a word of knowledge, uh, they need to deal with their father. I don't say a word. I say, who's the first person or situation? Hmm, my dad. I don't know why I'm thinking of that. I'll tell them later. I had a word to your dad. That'll give them corroboration and everything. But I don't need, they, otherwise they're going to need me to tell them. They're going to need me to give them a word. They're going to need me to be the source of grace. When in reality, you're equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry, to go to Jesus within them. Amen. You're not helping. You're actually hindering when you stick your two cents in. You think you look good and that you're being needful. It's more needful for you to teach them how to go to Jesus in them. And real discernment comes in knowing Jesus in them. Amen. Right? Now, if you move into that realm to where you're getting more and more sensitive, you're getting sensitive to what's going on in you, you're going to walk in peace more often than not. When you're walking at peace, you're also then going to perceive the atmosphere around you. If you're not at peace, you don't know what's going on. I, I, I basically, this sounds kind of, I don't know what it sounds like, but it's the truth. I don't listen to a lot of people's discernment because I'd want to be right there and feel the atmosphere. <laughs> People tell me, I had a dream about such and such. Well, I don't know in that dream whether you were feeling the joy of the Lord or whether or not you were in fear. It makes a big difference to me as to what's the source of the dream. I don't want to interpret the dream just based on content. I want to base it on the source, the source, the source. Did you know there's even places in Scripture, getting back to this, there's even places in this where the actual word in the Greek could mean source. Remember, God is the head of man, man is the head of woman. It can also be the source. God is the source of man. Hmm? Man was the source of woman out of Adam's rib. It doesn't necessarily mean a hierarchical authority structure. That's your free part. That's, that's the purpose of that is to ruffle feathers. So it's easy to contact spirit to spirit in our relationship with God. We can sit still. We can wean our soul like a weaned child with its mother. Secondly, we become sensitive to what's going on in us. Can you see the value of the small groups even? Teach people how to find out what's going on in them. Because you'll run into people, well, I haven't had a feeling since 1948. Okay. That's because you've been so good at suppressing most of your life. <laughs> but what gets suppressed will get expressed. Don't tell me you don't have meltdowns occasionally. Don't tell me you have temper tantrums occasionally. Don't tell me you don't have emotions. You don't have any good ones, maybe. That's what you're saying. Huh? Let's get you some good ones. The fruit of the Spirit is the way God designed us for. That's why He gave you emotions, for the fruit of the Spirit to be experienced. Now, I had some uh, buddies that were faith people, but it, it was almost amusing. They had the joy of the Lord by faith. By faith. They're going to tough it out by faith. I'm going, you look so miserable. I don't want that kind of faith. My faith is a confident inner assurance that I got it. And that's acting a whole lot different than you're acting with the joy of the Lord by faith. That ain't by faith, that's hope. <laughs> that's wishing. <laughs> now, this third element is to touch the spirit of the body. To touch the spirit of the body means that you can connect in a healthy way. But here's what we saw when we traveled. We saw, again, people that could not connect this way, that the part of the reason they couldn't connect this way is they already had soul ties with either a person, place, or thing, which is idolatry. Say that word back to me, idolatry. Anything that's more important than Jesus can be idolatry, and it can be something good. It can be 
an education. It can be your children. It can be a husband or a wife. You can make an idol out of anything, out of a place. We saw a lady basically went downhill because her idol was, but I want to have a house on the beach. You know, God will give you sometimes, you can make a way and make stuff, certain things happen. God will give you that house on the beach, but you can also put leanness into your soul. But you want what I want, and I want it now. You can do that with a man. I need a man. I need a woman. I need kids. I need this. You can make an idol out of anything that is legitimate in and of itself. And you can have, <clears throat> there's sexual violation, there's romantic sexual involvement, soul ties, there's parent-child, they call it parental inversion or substitute mate. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> child can be born and the man or the woman literally put a wall up against their mate. And even though they wouldn't consciously call that their mate, make that child everything that they needed. And if they get older, then they, they make, uh, a woman can make them her husband. The man can make that, 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 that daughter to the point of idolatry become like a wife. Even without sexual connotation. It's idolatry. This is why we have in the scripture, for this reason a man shall leave his mother and father. Ah. So there is healthy leaving and there's healthy cleaving. And many people cannot build solid relationships because they've got a soul tie with a person, place, or thing, or idolatry. And so I really believe that what we're going to see in the days ahead, and it is our next book, Breaking Soul Ties, that we're going to have to find how to deal more effectively with this. Because in 1 John, if we just use 1 John, the epistle, as a, a guideline. We walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. Okay, We're making connections by the Spirit the way the Spirit wants to make connections, not by our neediness making connections. And if there is a pull in the wrong, unhealthy way, a soul tie, matter of fact, everyone that's ever, that I've ever prayed for, especially, uh, I, I keep thinking of the, uh, some young girls that were teenagers, that when they got set free, I loved the way they explained it. They said, I'm in a bad relationship with a guy. I know it's a bad relationship, but I don't want to hate them. That sounds real Christian, doesn't it? But I can see the reasoning. I don't want to hate them and push them away, but I don't want to be with them. I know it's wrong. When they finally gave their emotions to God under the Lordship of Jesus and, and released them properly, here's what they said. I don't have to hate them, but I don't feel the pull. That's when you know you're free. I don't have to hate it or work overtime pushing away. Although you do some boundaries are okay. You need to establish boundaries. And quite frankly, uh, birds of a feather flock together. If you've got bad relationships, you're going to hang with bad relationships. You're going you're to be a product of bad relationships. You can say you're being redemptive, but I've watched too many people go down the tubes in the name of redemption, and I didn't see any redemption. <clears throat> now there's quality attachments like friendships, husband and wife, parent and child, brothers, sisters, extended family, and Christians, just heart knittings. Have you ever run into a Christian from a different part of the country even and just connect? Then you need to ask God, how can I redemptively respond to that connection? I don't quite understand it. it just, they just feel like they fit. Hmm? People discerned us when we first got married. Total strangers said, you two uh, uh, fit. And it, it was like they're picking up something in the spirit, but they don't necessarily know how to define it. But it's accurate nonetheless. How many have met people that you just clicked? Certain people just clicked. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good thing. You fortify that. 
and inquire of God, how can I be a blessing in that relationship? Because there's a counterfeit of using people and thinking it's a relationship. Hmm? There's a difference. Using people does not make a spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection. It's basically, they would be good for me. I need. Matter of fact, that was always in premarital counseling as a pastor. That was always my, that was always my oh dear oh Lord, I hope they don't say that. <laughs> She'd be good for me. Or he'd be good for me. And I'm going, yikes, we're going to have to somehow get them to where I want to see them become everything God's got for them. That's the proper response. I want them to become all they could possibly be. Not, they'd be good for me, because then I wouldn't have to work. Or they'd be, they'd be good for me because I need sex, you know. Those are not good reasons. I even had them say, well, the reason we're getting married is because we both like the same things. We both like to walk in the woods. Okay. I hope it goes beyond that. Unless you're going to walk in the woods, live in the woods, work in the woods. <laughs> Unless you're going to be a pair of forest rangers, I would really find a little more common ground here. <laughs> now, now, when we do our television taping, I will try not to be so funny so nobody laughs. But... You can't, you can't come. <laughs> but here's, if we just use one John, that little epistle of 1 John, you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship with God and with one another, healthy relationship. But it's all of 1 John is basically summarized with love, 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 love. And the very last sentence is, little children, guard yourself from idols. Why, why, why would that, after going love, 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 why would the end verse, the last verse be, little children, guard yourself from idols? Because you can make an idol out of anything. Love gives, love frees. And here's the reason I also feel small groups and accountability is, is part of it. When God taught me intimacy, and it started with shut up and listen. <laughs> Sit still, don't talk. Don't move around, don't write, don't read. Sit still. That was not easy for me. I was a hyperactive kid. But it was the greatest lesson in the spirit because most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. While you're talking, you miss what, a lot of what God's saying. Hmm? Well, in that, in that little season, God showed me the progress of the Spirit. And it's in one of our books, I think the last one, uh, Flowing in the River of God's Will. He showed me, Dennis, in hindsight, here's the way I developed you. First of all, you started with being aware of spirit-to-spirit -spirit touch. And some people have been in the church forever, and the only touch they ever had was in a meeting where they got goosebumps. And then never felt anything again. All right? It starts with a touch. But if you honor God, have a meek, humble, tremble at His Word, and He is the living Word, what you will do is when you feel that touch, you don't let anything interrupt that touch. Nothing. No negative emotion, no nothing. And what it does is it gradually strengthens because it's life. And the law of the life in Christ Jesus increases by reason of use. And even baby steps of obedience to that touch, you stay with that touch, it changes to embrace. And once you feel that embrace, then you don't ever want to stop. I can remember kneeling at the side of a bed and my driver, I carpooled, to my office job in the engineering department. He'd be honking out there and I'd be going, I don't want to leave and he's out there. Because the embrace, it wasn't just a touch, it was the embrace. You didn't want to leave. And that's when God very lovingly says, because that is so important to you, 
I'm going to teach you that you don't have to leave that embrace because you're going to work. I go, whoa, this sounds really good. I get to, he goes, from now on, because I had the bad concept, and many Christians have this, of going in and out of prayer. Does that sound logical? It's not accurate, though. He says, you have special time and all the time. Special time and all the time. So Jesus, didn't he have special time? But he had all the time. That's communion, moment by moment, relationship with God, practicing his presence 24-7. So I saw then what God did was first he had to get me to sit still, and that was not easy. He had to get me to not talk and just emanate and honor him by listening instead of talking. And then that I would touch him. And then, of course, I taught you, he taught me proper forgiveness was if all of a sudden I'm touching him and then I see my foreman's face in my head with a snarl. And down here, I went, I didn't like that foreman. And he, don't let anything come between what you and I have together, Dennis. And then I would let, out of that new creation me, I would let that Jesus the forgiver flow through and take away that wall of hurt, anger, and I could see that snarly foreman's face. This is real life, people. I didn't make some imagination thing up here. I didn't make some fake little story, fantasy. But I saw him snarling, and down here I had peace. That's the supernatural exchange. That is the work of the cross. Anything other than that is a fabrication of your own imagination. A lot of inner healing is fabrication of imagination. And it's a substitute for the work of the cross. And it might feel good momentarily, but it doesn't accomplish long-standing relationship. Only the cross. There's no standard that is superior to the cross. If the cross is not applied, there's no supernatural transaction. You just change the subject. I've seen people, oh, but I, I was in this terrible car crash and it was traumatic. Oh, I see Jesus coming and he carried me out of the car and he's smiling. Well, that would make me feel better, but I didn't deal with the trauma. I changed the subject. I made it something more pleasant. There's a lot of that going on. But there's no substitute for a genuine work of the cross. No, you don't need to see that foreman smiling. If that foreman was mean toward you and he had a mean face, then deal with it. Face your fears. Don't fabricate some, oh, I see Jesus is holding my foreman and he's smiling now. <laughs> well, that felt kind of good down here. But if I saw my foreman at work again and he has that snarling face, I'm down here, I go, Durr. you didn't accomplish anything. You changed the subject. You did not bring it to death on the cross. Is this making sense so far? All right, so if you can sit still long enough to welcome the touch of God spirit to spirit, breath to breath, heart to heart, oh, it's glorious. You just stay there, even if it's uncomfortable and you get a little wiggly, and you want to, but I need to go in the garage and see if there's enough oil for an oil change. Write it down and get back there. Don't let the distraction pull you from that intimacy because if you go from, the, the simplicity of that touch to an embrace, that embrace will build in you going from special time to all the time. And your walk will be more spirit-led. And embrace does something else. If you can stay the course where if intimacy with God really is important to you, after the embrace, you find, and it's, the only way you can describe it is all of a sudden it satisfies. Spiritual satisfaction is in Him. And all those things that pull that you used to feed yourself with, because I need, I need, I need, all of a sudden, no, I found satisfaction. Now, satisfaction is aimed at a disposition of your soul. It's a, it's a spiritual relationship to where I am satisfied in Him. But remember, discernment is 
discerning the source. If all of a sudden the true source in your gut is I'm satisfied with Jesus and my relationship with Him, then here's what you're going to do then. Now without trying in the flesh, you're going to be motivated to satisfy His heart as a primary objective in your life. How many people would like to just say, I'd like to just live with the consciousness of satisfying the heart of God? You try to do that without dealing with your own personal wants and desires and fleshly desires, appetites, soul ties, idolatrous relationships, and you're not going to do it. You're going you're to exhaust yourself trying to do something that only God Himself can do through you when you're properly surrendered to Him. So what, what would the stages be again? Touch. And if you learn to cultivate that touch enough, you, you enter into an embrace. And it feels like strength. That strength then of the embrace becomes uh, normative at some level. Special time and all the time. But then all of a sudden out of this satisfaction that I found what I needed. Many of you when you got saved found that answer, didn't you? When you first got saved, this is the answer. I searched in drugs, parties, I tried everything to fill that void. But when I got saved, they filled that void. And it was, this is that, what I've been looking for. And here I was avoiding religion at all costs. <laughs> and yet Jesus ends up being the answer, not religion. So I'm in this place of satisfaction, but if you truly are motivated by satisfaction as a character, motive, remember discernment goes by motive. You're not trying to prove something. You're not trying to get something. You want to satisfy the heart of the Father. And that turns into overflowing love. Abounding love is what the scripture would call it. Let your love abound. You want to overflow? You've got to come from a place of satisfaction or it'll be just flesh effort. Out of that abounding love, guess what it points to? What, what has abounding love? The Father's heart. All of a sudden now, that abounding love is reflecting the Father's heart. Oh, what if we keep God going? What if we start operating out of the Father's heart? What would be the primary motivation? that would flow out of us, out of the Father's heart. Bringing many sons to glory. And if you read your Bible, I've got news for you. Every single one of you was called to that. You may stop way before that happens. But the eternal purpose of God was to be the firstborn among many brethren to bring many sons unto glory. If that is not part of your vision, you've got some other vision for a cottage and a ministry on the beach and la, 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 la. and if your vision ends with you I'm not impressed because the vision you business any of the seven mountains of society that God's called you to it still should end in God if that vision ends and it's all about you being seen and heard I feel sorry for you really because it's idolatry no matter how good it looks or how religious it sounds if it's all about you it ends in you that's not God He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the author and the finisher. And it's God who is at work in you to will and to perform. Right? Can you see that? So soul ties need to be broken. And soul ties don't have to be sexual. It can be a person, place, or thing. It can be ministry. It can be a job. It can be a husband. It can be an education. It can be a, a wife. It can be a child. How do, how do I know if I have one of those? Oh, this is fun. This is easy. When I close my eyes, ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Not somebody else search your heart. You let the Holy Spirit search your heart. What can I not let go of? Father, right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and those watching by Ustream, YouTube, those that are watching by video, get quiet right now before the Lord. It only takes a moment. Not, it's not about you figuring anything out. Don't figure anything out. But you might just be pleasantly surprised, or surprised anyway, by what comes up. Holy Spirit, show me. Any person, place, or thing. And no matter what He shows me, who He shows me, or what He shows me, 
right now. Okay, there's, uh, and I'm getting the word, so that it must be more than one person. I'm getting a job that some have made an idol out of family. Let's release. They're God's servants, not yours. They belong to Him and not to you. You are a steward, not an owner. I release now from my belly. I release any demands or expectations that I placed on them. I'm releasing them into the loving, capable hands of God right now. I'm releasing them. Now, if you release them, here's the part that brings healing. You're releasing the demands and expectations. You're releasing them into the loving, capable hands of God who can work far better than you can. Now here's what sets you free. After I release them, you might feel a little bit of an ache, but you need to release them nonetheless until it changes to peace. I release them. Now here's the part that the Holy Spirit taught me and I saw wonderful fruit come as a result. I offer my emotions back to God. I offer my emotions back to God. I, my emotions belong to God. They do not belong to a person, place, or thing. My emotions belong to God. <laughs> I don't have to dislike what I released. I don't have to push it away. But it doesn't control me anymore. I don't feel the pull. How many saw something specifically? I'm not going to ask you what it is, but raise your hand. Saw something that was a little bit tough to let go of. Good thing, even, in a lot of cases. If it's a bad thing, it's obvious. You need to let it go. I said that we could equip and cultivate a healthy church if we can teach everyone to deal with their issues but die to an agenda because agendas are deceiving. You'll call it your dream. You'll call it a goal. Did you know every goal does not necessarily point to God? Every goal does not lead you into true north. Are you saying not to have goals, not to have I'm saying you basically need to set goals to establish the purposes of God. <laughs> but you need to know what the purposes of God are for your life. And you've got to want it with a pure heart. I think we can, we can coerce a generation of people talking about their dreams and pursuing their dreams when in most cases they're not necessarily a God dream. You're doing them a great injustice. God created a plan for you before the foundation of the earth. He prepared works for you to walk in them. Wouldn't you rather walk in them than your own plan, no matter how glorious your plan looks? If we could teach people to deal with their emotional issues, and get back into lordship and die to their agendas, you would have a healthy congregation. You would have a healthy family. And you would be free. Here's the downside. The downside to soul ties is you do not see the provision that God has for you because you're attached in the wrong ways. If you're attached in the wrong ways, God can send you the right people and you'll never see it. They can be right in front of your face, but you'll never realize that that was a God-ordained divine appointment because you're already connected in an unhealthy way to a person, place, or thing. So can you see why First John says, walk in the light as he is in the light? Keep the walls down. That's what we did in the men's group. We just basically talked about ourselves. But basically, there's, there's, there's successes and there's failures. And, and we learn to 
pray through them. But if you keep it in the light, guess what? You are already stronger. You're already stronger. Because God moves relationally in the light. As He is in the light, you have fellowship one with another. We want to skip this part. How many, how many of you know people that are, that would consider themselves quality Christians, but it's just me and God, me and God, me and God, and that's deception. If you walk in the light, it's got to be this way too. If you don't walk in the light this way too, that's a bunch of baloney that me and God got this great relationship. I just don't need Christians. <laughs> I'm a surfboard Christian. <laughs> just me and God and the surfboard, that's all I need. I don't need those other people. And actually, my eye opener as a baby Christian, where I could feel God grieving, I said, God, it, it, and those of you who learned simple prayer, you learned that this is the way I learned it, was basically, God, I want your thoughts and how you feel and what you choose. Mind, will, and emotions. I want your thoughts, how you feel, not what you choose. And I w went to church, a little Pentecostal church, and, and the people that couldn't get along with anybody were constantly telling me how much they love those, those missionaries in Africa. And I'm going, did you ever go to Africa? No. <laughs> did you ever meet them in Africa? No. So you love these people you don't know, but you can't get along with anybody in the room. I'm not impressed. I think I love the people they never saw. You never had any interaction. No, the real test of love <laughs> is learning to love your differences even and navigating differently with different people. You know the five, I'm going to close with this, the five functions that most pastors do marriage counseling traditionally. And by the Spirit, I think I always knew better, but it was the role of the man, the role of the woman, finances, sex, and in-laws. <laughs> and don't think that isn't hold true. I got too many years of ministry. I've seen all five of them become powerful obstacles <laughs> to relationship. In-laws. That's why to this day I said I'll marry somebody, but I don't do I don't do I don't do I'm not a wedding planner. Because I watched in-laws <laughs> Come in, I go, oh my goodness, we need, the, all these people need saved first. <laughs> all right. But as far as the role of the man and the role of the woman, I did not teach traditional roles. I didn't even like that word role. But I basically said, man, know what your temperament is. Woman, know what your temperament is. Learn to love each other's differences. Learn how the other person operates love their differences, and get into a place of mutual respect. Then we'll deal with the sexual issues, then we'll deal with your finances, and then we'll deal with your in-laws. In some case, don't, under, don't minimize in-laws. Because for this reason a man shall leave his mother and his father to cleave unto his wife. But sometimes they don't want them to go. It's idolatry. That's what I'm saying. Single ladies... Got a boyfriend? Find out if he's still living with mom. Ask him if he's got a job. Guys, ask her, is that your real hair? <laughs> I want to see you without makeup. <laughs> ask a lot of questions, right? Let's Continue to look in the days ahead. Little children, keep yourself from idols. We know what idols are, right? It can be something that in and of itself is good. We don't want that. And relationally, we want to move all the way through the intimate relationship to where you are fulfilling the biblical command where God says to bring many sons unto glory. As sons as sons and daughters, obviously. We're the bride of Christ. We're sons, sons of God. And by the way, the church will not project an accurate view of the face of the Father until women and men are seen where the walls of hostility are removed and they are complementing each other as God's creation and expression. And that also goes with 
the wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile before you're going to see clearly the one new man. When two people get married, you're a new creation, something that never existed before. You've got to see what does that expression look like, right? We're like that. I was so deeply in love with Jennifer, and Jennifer was all in love with me, and we're all excited. And the lady that I rented to said, look, <laughs> God didn't just give her to you and you to her. He put you together for his purposes. That's a healthier view. And all the infatuation and love and good feelings, that is the ultimate truth. Without Jennifer, there would be no books. Without me, there would have been nothing for her to write. <laughs> it's true. Everything, she documented everything I did to disciple her. Teach me. And basically, it's not a formula, but it's basically observations on how the Holy Spirit actually worked in the process. So first feel, forgive is not a formula. First feel forgive is actually the way you process spiritual relationship. I love it when people say, well, I tried that method. Then you missed the point. If it was a method to you, Jesus wasn't even in it. Huh. Because it was basically a flow of the way the Holy Spirit operates on a consistent basis. Amen. Well, do you feel charged, influenced, encouraged, guilty? No? <laughs> no condemnation? Oh, okay, good. So, Father, we just thank you that you who began a good work are continuing that good work. And that we're going to move in the love of God, but we're also going to beware of idols. Beware, little children, of idols. And we're going to move from from the child stage of relationship and intimacy. We're going to move. Here, just close your eyes and just do this in closing. This is fun. God, I feel your presence right now in my spirit. I'm touching you. I'm welcoming that touch to be maintained as an embrace. And when this service is over, I'm going to be aware that we are connected and that I don't walk away from that connection, but I do walk and I do things and I go places. And I relate to other people, but that connection is maintained. As that connection is maintained, I'm going to find greater and greater satisfaction in life. And from that place of satisfaction, because I belong, it is a belonging, and because I belong to you, I've got a lot to give. So I can focus on satisfying your heart without effort. And as it flows out of me, it will overflow and increase. As he is to us, so are we in this world, overflowing. And as we overflowing, we get more and more of the Father's heart. As we move more and more into the Father's heart and his perspective, our goal in all of our vision will be to bring many sons unto glory, to bring sons and daughters, spiritual family as well as natural family. In Jesus' name. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, 
healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.